as we possibly can. Galatians chapter 4, let's look at verse number 8. I want to give you tonight the pitfalls of legalism. The pitfalls of legalism. Now this is again is a very, uh, a lot of folks have taken the word legalism and they have, they've almost made it uh, uh, where it's not, uh, the, anybody that has any standards to them, they, they call them a legalist and that's not true. Uh, I know what a legalist is, and I've even been accused of being a legalist, and I think that's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. I'm not by any means a legalist. Um, I do know some that would 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 qualify, I think, but we're going to see what the Bible definition of what what the Bible says about the pitfalls of legalism. Look at Galatians chapter four, and let's start in verse number eight. The Bible says, "How be it then, when ye knew not God?" Ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are, ye have not injured me at all. Ye know how, through infirmity of the flesh, I preach the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation which was in my flesh, ye despise not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is the blessedness uh, ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. I am, there, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously affect you, but, but not well. Yea, though, uh, yea, they would exclude you, that ye might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected, uh, always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you, my little children." of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. We see these pitfalls of legalism that I believe we'll study in just these uh, few verses here in Galatians chapter 4. And I want you to notice that legalism is detrimental to the Christian life. I want to point out some things about that tonight. And, and, and Paul kind of points out those several pitfalls of legalism in these few verses here uh, that these Judaizers that P Paul has kind of encountered in, in Galatians trying to uh, teach these folks at Galatians uh, at Galatia rather that these Judaizers had managed to snare many of these believers that Paul had won to Christ into believing that what they did was not good enough. Paul's trying to teach them some things. I want you to notice the slavery of legalism. What does it do? It, it binds people. It, it binds them. I want you to notice some things. Legalism enslaves the believer tonight. The Christian life is not designed to be lived uh, under a rigid set of rules under a slave master, but rather as a son. Now, we talked about that last week. Well, as a son, instead of a slave, uh, the son of a, of a caring father. If you notice, there's a big difference between a son's relationship with his dad and a slave's relationship with its master. The slave does as the master says because it has to. He's in bondage. The son should do what the father says because he loves him. And there's a bond there. There's two different relationships going there. Uh, the Bible says in John 8, 36, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. So there is no way to enjoy freedom as a son when you're fettered as a slave. No way. Uh, there's two different things. You're either a son or a slave. But I want you to understand that, it, it, and don't, please don't misunderstand that Christian liberty is not freedom to live any old way that you want to live. Now there's there's the there's both sides of the spectrum. There's the crowd that says we're under grace, so therefore, and we are. Thank the Lord, we're under grace. But uh, that's not our ticket to live any old way we want to live. No, uh, that's that's not Christian liberty, my friend. Nor is it freedom to ignore ignore God's clear commands in His Word. 
No way. Uh, the Bible says in John, chapter number 8, verses 31 and 32, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the new, truth shall make you free. So liberty is always based on the word of God. Remember that. Liberty is always based on the Word of God. So here's the deal. If you'll live your life according to what the Bible says, you'll be always better off than doing what uh, you think or what man says. I would base it on Scripture, on what the Word of God says. Uh, I'd be very careful to just pull up some guy on YouTube or on Facebook and listen to what he says when he has no Bible to back up uh, what he says. And just because he pulls out a Bible doesn't mean that he's taking the Scripture in context. Amen? So a lot of times these guys will take Scriptures and distort them and twist them and, and uh, they'll, they, they will just make it sound like they want it to sound. But my friend, uh, if your Scripture is rightly divided, then I would base my beliefs on what the Word of God says. And that's liberty. Liberty is always based to Psalms 119 verse 45. And I will walk at liberty for I seek thy precepts. I love that verse. I will walk in liberty for I seek thy precepts. So legalism says that Christ died for our sins. Okay, so that's what legalism will say. Christ died for our sins but that we still need to follow all the commands of the Old Testament, the dietary uh, and ceremonial laws and, and the uh, holy days and the old covenant in order to be right with God. So it's okay that Christ died for our sins, but we have to o still obey those Old Testament laws and those Old Testament things. And friend, that's nothing more than legalism. Now, people may say this. They may say, well, Christ died uh, for our sins. Yes, but if you're not living a certain way, then you must not be saved. Friend, that again, that should be considered legalism because they're adding works to salvation. It's Jesus plus nothing uh, equals salvation. Amen? Jesus did the work uh, at Calvary. He died on the cross. He shed His blood. Three days later, He arose from the dead for our sins. Amen? It doesn't matter what we look like. It doesn't matter what we talk like. It doesn't matter where we're from or what our last name is or what our skin color is. What matters is have we put our faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Endeavoring to live and promote holiness is not legalism. May I remind you, so a holy life, someone that promotes a holy living and clean living, that's not a legalist, friend. That, that is a holy person. By the way, uh, we're still commanded to be holy in 2017, almost 2018. So if a preacher gets behind the pulpit and he mentions anything about standards or the right kind of living or clean living, then someone says out there, well, he must be a legalist. No, uh, it's called holiness. But if that same man says, now, in order to be saved or... If you, uh, if you ever got saved, you'd be doing this, or you'd be living up to this thing, or you'd be doing this to be saved, then friend, then he's adding to what, uh, what Paul is here talking about. He can uh, add to salvation. That's dangerous because there's nothing to add to salvation. Amen? So I want you to notice the slavery of legalism tonight. Notice their pitfall past. Look at verse 8 again, if you would, please. And it's leading me to, to really one point, and I want, you to, I want you to see this tonight. Their pitfall past, their pitiful past. I want you to notice in verse number 8, How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. So Paul, Paul kind of points them back to their pre-conversion condition. He, he kind of goes back a little bit. And notice when he says, he says here in verse 8 again, When ye knew not God. When ye knew not God. So, of course, if you're saved tonight, you remember a time when you maybe, unless you're a child, and a lot of times children get saved, and we, we'd like to see them get saved as a child, but, but a lot of times people will go on... And, uh, and I got saved as a 13-year-old boy. I remember it very clearly. I don't remember much before that, just a little bit, but I don't remember a whole lot. But some of you in here remember before you got saved. Paul's talking about, uh, he says here in that little phrase, when ye knew not God. So this is their ignorance when they didn't know any better. Paul, notice what he says in verse 8 again. He uses another phrase, did service unto them which by nature are no gods. 
there's some phrases there. So Paul kind of reminds them that they, before they were saved, they were under bondage of idolatry. So before salvation, there was idolatry. So in their ignorance, they did not know the true God, so they served whatever came down the pike. If it was Dagon, they served Dagon. If it was, if it was uh, uh, whatever, Delilah, or whatever the, 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 some of these uh, gods were, whatever them gods were, that's what they served. It could have been a little statue in their home or the latest fad in the city. Oh, let's go serve this God, whatever it was, out of ignorance. Paul said, you remember that. Uh, he, he was made to, man is a religious creature. You're made to worship something or someone. Hence, all of the idolatry exists in the world today. I believe we're all created to worship something. Amen? And I believe that's why a lot of people, when they're not saved, they do worship something. Whether it be... Uh, season tickets to their favorite NFL football game on Sunday. Or it could be that bass boat in that backyard. And boy, they just enjoy that weekend. Or maybe it's uh, whatever it is. We're all created with something in us to worship. And a lot of times that's why we see the stadiums filled with people. You say, uh, preacher, how in the world can people just act so godless on Sunday? That's why they're, they're worshiping their God. That's what they're doing. And we're all created with that in us, but many of them are ignorant to the fact of what they're doing. You understand? That's why it's our job to go tell uh, them about the gospel. Tell them that Jesus saves and tell them those things. You know what the Bible says in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1? We, we've covered thir- uh, 1 Thessalonians but in our studies, but it says in chapter 1 and verse 9 that they turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So many of them were serving gods. This same Paul that wrote Galatians was also the author of First Thessalonians. And, and, and Paul knew something about idol worship. And no doubt Paul, before he got saved, was guilty of idol worship. He remembers of what he did before he got saved. So Paul said, when they found out that Jesus Christ was the only way to heaven, they turned from their false gods to the only true God. Amen? That's exactly what happens when we get saved. We turn from whatever it was that we were worshiping and following before, and we turn and we start following Christ. Amen? And that's how you know someone gets saved, is you can watch that fruit in them. They turn, there's a change, old things are passed away. Whatever it was that they were following now has become new, and now they have a hunger inside of them to feast on the Word when they used to feast on whatever the idol was cooking. Amen? Whatever it is. Whatever they were feasting on before, now they have a new appetite. Amen? That's why Wednesday night church is so important. Because it it creates an appetite in you that the world cannot fulfill. Only God can fulfill that. It's called God's Word. See, the world doesn't have an appetite. I could go and preach this message in, in some, uh, some uh, uh, place of ill repute tonight, or I could preach it in some place like a ball stadium. Or a, or, or, and listen, I love ball tonight. I love playing basketball. I love watching basketball. I, I love all sports just about. But I understand that if I were to bring this message tonight in a, in a basketball at halftime to a big stadium full of 10, 12,000 people, and I were to teach on Galatians tonight, or even give the gospel, I would be, many uh, many of them, they'd be like casting pearls before swine. They wouldn't care less. As a matter of fact, they might start chucking things at me and booing, and, and, and there no doubt security would have to come in, surround me. And maybe, I'm just saying, it could happen that way. Doubt I would get an applause. They'd probably say, okay, enough with the guy. Get him out of here. We want some more ball. Hey, get a, sh- shut him up. Uh, we don't want to hear that. Why? Because they have no appetite for it. That's when we say, hey, we're having Wednesday night church. And hey, you get to drive out in the rain five days before Christmas. And, and you get to, uh, and, and you boy, you just, you get to come out when it's been pouring down cats and dogs and traffic and it's dark outside. And you get to come down and open up the Word of God. Hey, you, you'll have some people say, well, I've got this going on, I've got that going on, and I've got all this going on, I just don't feel like it. Or you've got a crowd that say, hey, you know what, we're going to go out there and fight the elements, and we're going to, we're going to hear the Word of God preached tonight and taught tonight. We, we want, we're hungry for it. I want God to do something in my heart. I want God to do... Hey, you know what? 
Old things are passed away. Now, there's a lot of folks tonight that have a, a real good excuse not being here. Lots of sickness. I'm not getting on anybody tonight. But what I'm saying is, if there's a hunger, if there's a hunger, and, and come to the place where you can get fed. Amen? Just come out there and get fed. I like to hear preaching in my car, in my truck. I like to hear preaching in my house. I like to preach to myself. I like to preach to my kids and my wife. I like to preach. I like to hear it preach. I like to be preached too. I liked what happened Sunday. I get to sit over here and hear somebody shuck the corn and preach. You say, preach what? I need fed. And by the way, I need my daily food. I need those personal devotions. I need that. So, uh, listen, we, we, we turn from those idolatry ways. We turn from worshiping idols to the true and living God. And John says it in uh, John chapter 3, verse 18. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Jesus, let me just remind you tonight, Jesus is the only way to heaven. The only way. He's always been the only way. He will always be the only way. If you're trying, I told that man today, his name was Brian, and I bought a couple rocking chairs off of Brian this morning. And I said, Brian, uh, do you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die? Brian said, well, pretty honest guy. I said, Brian, no doubt you are. I was getting pretty mad at Brian there for a little bit because Brian wasn't where he was going to tell me he was going to be. And uh, I waited, waited, tried to call him three times. Brian didn't show up, turned around, and was driving up the road. And Brian finally called me. And I said, Brian, I said, uh, uh, man, I about left. And I was just a few minutes away, and I thought he had done stood me up. you got to be careful with some of those, but you know what I mean. And uh, just just folks, random people. And, and uh Anyway, and uh, sorry about that. <laughs> And I uh, didn't know that would answer. Anyway, I thought, I man, somebody is talking to me right now. Brian is talking to me right now. Got to be careful. Sorry about that. That was my watch, and, um, and I didn't know that would do that. So I'm, I do apologize. I'm supposed to mute those things, take them off. I'll leave it in the truck next time. Amen. That was really strange. I will not get over that tonight. Whew. Anyway. Brian was acting. Uh, he he was he was a good guy, and, and matter of fact, uh, uh, he he thought he was good enough to get to heaven. He really did. Until I opened up the Bible and showed him that your goodness is not good enough. And and Brian, listen, tears started welling up in Brian's eyes, and we he thought we were there for rocking chairs, but listen, rocking chairs were the last thing on my mind. Hey, Brian bowed his head and asked Christ to save him. By the way, he's going to try to get his girlfriend in church uh, maybe Sunday. If he can't make it for the Sunday morning, the Sunday evening service, he's going to try. I said, Brian, it's a wonderful time to get. He didn't. He wasn't a part of a church anywhere. He's just a good guy. But he he thought he was good enough to get to heaven. There's a ton of people out there, but there is no way but Jesus. No way but Jesus. Now he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In the book of Acts, Peter declared, Acts chapter 4, verse 12, I love this verse, neither is there salvation in any other. I love that. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That name is Jesus. Jesus. Hey, I love it. The, the best time of the year to share the gospel with anybody is this time of the year. This time of the year in Easter. I mean, buddy, it doesn't get any easier. Uh, what are we about to celebrate? Christmas. Why are we celebrating Christmas? Well, uh, well, you know, it's time we give gifts to each other. Why are we give gifts to each other? Well, you know, I, I, it's just what we do. No, we do it because Jesus came, the greatest gift of all. Amen? Hey, we're celebrating His birthday. And you know, Brian even knew that. A lost man knew. Oh yeah, it's about Jesus. He came to Bethlehem. He died on the cross. Oh, uh, he knew, but he didn't know. Amen. He didn't know that was the way to heaven. There's a lot of folks that way. I like what the Apostle John said in 1 John 5, 12. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Hey, can I ask you, are you living tonight? Are you living tonight? If you don't know Jesus, you're not living. The Bible says that if you have the Son, you have life. Boy, there's a, I preach a message on, on, out of that on, on, uh, on uh, two ways. You two ways. Either you have life or you don't have life. Hey, it's just the way. Either you're dead in your trespasses or you just started living. I, hey, I'm just going to tell you right now, I'd rather choose Jesus. Amen? The Galatians who once served idols because they didn't know any better, they were without God. There's a lot of people out here that just don't know. They're just without God. And how shall they hear without a preacher? 
That's why we have to print gospel tracts. That's why we have to get them out here and, and get you out here and try to get you to, to, to witness. And I, you say, preacher, why can't we just uh, uh, have uh, you know uh, some tracts? And, and pa- why do we got to come to a meeting and come to a place? It keeps us accountable. I, I believe that we ought to come and just be accountable and show up and say, you know what, I, I'm going to go down. Isn't it sad that we have to feel that way, that we got to go down the church and meet and go? But that's the way it is, and it keeps me accountable. It keeps you accountable to go out and tell our community about the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that, that there's folks out here that are really just waiting on us to come. A lot of churches have the mentality that... that uh, well, they'll come to us if they need God. No, they're not going to come to you. More than likely, you're going to need to go to them. Very few come to our church. Now, there's some that will come and walk out and get saved. Uh, I, I look back here and I see a few that's been saved this year, and it's a blessing to see them here. And I praise God for that. That's a sign of growth, and, and they're growing in the Lord. That's wonderful. But can I say tonight that if, you, uh, if, you are, um, uh, if you're just waiting for people to... To, to come and, and just come to our church and get saved that way, it, it's not going to happen more than likely. We're going to have to win them on the streets. Amen? Have to tell them the gospel. So notice their pitiful condition and their pitiful past, but then notice their present position. Look at verse 9. I'm almost done, but look at verse 9. This is kind of the meat of the message. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God. Notice that little phrase right there. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God. So to know God and to be known of God speaks of a personal relationship. So do you know God? God, we know God knows us, but do you know God? It's a personal relationship. The gospel had been preached and these Galatians had turned from their sins and idols to the true and living God. And they knew God and God knew them. I want to remind you tonight that Christianity is a relationship. It's not a religion. Amen. It's not religion. I'm not preaching religion tonight. I'm not preaching the Baptist way. I'm preaching Jesus' way. Amen. I'm not preaching that you have to be saved the Baptist way. No, you've got to be saved the Bible way. Amen? It's the way. It's the narrow way. But it's Jesus' way. So many people are wrapped up in denomination and they're wrapped up in, in all this religious and man's said and man's traditions. You know what the Bible says? Man's traditions is a snare. It's a snare. There's a lot of churches that are hung up on tradition. The traditions of men. Traditions of men. That's a snare. It's, a, it, it's just something that causes so many people. You know what's full of man's tradition? Is the Catholic Church. I mean, the, the Catholic Church is nothing but man's religion. Go light this many candles and go pray to this. And rub this many rosary beads and, and do this and, and confess this many sins and do this over here on this certain night. And, and, all. and folks, can I tell you right now, that's nothing but man's tradition that causes people to die and go to hell. The Jehovah Witnesses have their traditions and the Mormons have their traditions and, and uh, the Methodists have their traditions. The Church of Christ has their traditions. But hey, guess what? That sends you to hell if you don't put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh yes. And by the way, the Baptists have their traditions. We're just as guilty. I mean, just as guilty. There's a lot of people sitting in Baptist seats and Baptist pews on Sunday, and they're, listen, they're not fit for the kingdom of God. They've not been born again and blood washed because they've never put their faith. They've put their faith in the, in the roll. They've put their faith in the tithing record. They've put their faith in the choir. But see, can I just say this? God knows them, knows about He knows the very number of the hair on your head. He knows them, but hold on a second. He does not know them as a son. And they certainly don't know him as a father. There's not a relationship. You know what they're serving? Religion. Religion. Religion has sent a many a man to hell. Religion. I'm not preaching. Religion. The Bible says in Matthew 7, can you turn over there with me, Matthew 7? I want you to see some very, uh, this is the words of Christ. So I want you to see this. Matthew chapter 7, 
we see these Galatians had turned from this idolatry to a personal relationship. My friend, that's what we should preach here, is a personal relationship. Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. Now, look, stop and look at me real quick. How many of you, and be serious, has cast out devils before? You've cast devils out of somebody. Not if you've had them in you. Uh, uh, there may be a few that might be debatable. Might have a few here tonight. But you've cast devils. I have not. Now, I've been in a few places where some I've, I've prayed for someone that has, and I've been in a few encounters with... Uh, demonic things and all, but I've never been the one that come out of him and all this. I've never done that. I do believe in it. I believe it still today. Uh, my dad uh, has been in several situations where, uh, folk, matter of fact, recently a woman called the church up there and he was telling me about it that she was full of the devil. And she said, Preacher, I'm calling because I need help. And her dad, and she started coming to church, and the dad started trying to get her help. She, and by the way, let me tell you the gateway to demonic oppression and dom, demonic possession is drugs. Uh, let me just look at me real quick. Those that are addicted to drugs, and let me just tell you, painkillers and all of them, all of them, all the drugs except NyQuil, all of them. I like NyQuil. All of them is a gateway because you're, you're putting something in you and substituting something in you that, that you're, 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 you're substituting something in you that makes you act a different way than you, than you should. Whether it takes you on a high, whether it's uh, something now that you're dependent on, and guess what that brings about? It brings about a, a enslavement to that drug. Now, again, I'm not saying all medicine. There are some of you that are on medicine that you need to be on medicine. I believe there's some medicines that 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 get your chemicals in in order, and and I believe in that. I do. I believe there's people that need to be balanced out. If you're imbalanced, buddy, woo. Let me tell you, I've met a few of them. Get balanced. Amen. Get balanced. I'm not preaching anti-drugs and anti-anything because if, if I'm sick, I need something. Amen. I, I'm going to take some medicine if the doctor feels... But hold on a second. How about the... I'm dealing with a few people right now that said, Preacher, I, I started out and I maybe needed a few of those, but I became dependent on it and it opened up channels in my life for demonic oppression. If you study out that demonic and demonology and all that stuff, it's the, even the root word is pharma, where we get our same word pharmaceuticals. Where do you believe all that conjured up? Bunch of witches and all them warlocks and different ones, even past in, in the Bible days where they would literally come up with things and seduce people and have them drink this potion and drink this drug. And they would... I mean, that's where they would get it. it. You think drugs is something that happened back in the 60s and the 70s. Friend, drugs have been around since the Bible days. Oh yes, there was a drug pop problem in Jesus' day. These, these witches and things. These, uh, Brother Jacob, we got a good story about witches, don't we? Amen. And I'm not going to go there. Amen. That's another story. But notice what he says there, prophesy in thy name. Then notice, and in thy name hath cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. So uh, there's some of you in here that's done some wonderful works. All right, but hold on a second. Then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So guess what the Lord says? Everything that I just mentioned, you're workers of iniquity. Because you knew not the one that saves you. You knew not the one that can save. You knew not the Lord Jesus. You knew not. You were trying to do it on your own. You were trying to cast out devils in my name, but to get to heaven, you were trying to prophesy in my name. You were doing all these things, but that ain't what gets you to heaven. They never put their faith in the Lord Jesus. They had a knowledge, but they did not have a relationship. Many people know about God. They know about that historical Jesus. There are people today, look at me, church. There's people today 
that will have a nativity manger scene, nativity on their mantle or in their front yard, and it'll say Merry Christmas, and, and Jesus is the reason for the season, and not even know who they're talking about. They just got it at Hobby Lobby. Oh, that's pretty. I like that Jesus. Isn't that cute? Je Baby Jesus. But they, they don't know. They don't know. Isn't that sad? Notice that these people were religious. Jesus addressed them as Lord. Uh, Lord means that preeminence. They had prophesied. They had cast out devils. They had done many wonderful works. But yet Jesus commanded them to depart and declare. Rebecca's not here tonight. My wife... Not here tonight, but her, her salvation testimony is wonderful. Now, I don't know if any of you ever heard it before. But we were married, and, and, and I was youth pastor there at the church, and we had a, an evangelist come to our church and uh, by the name of Carl Hatch, great man of God. And he was preaching, and it was just a Monday or Tuesday night, I can't remember, but I was already youth pastor in there. Had, I think Jake was born, and Rebecca was not feeling well that night, and uh, I said, well, I'm going to go on to Revival. And uh, we, it was like a Monday through a Wednesday night. And this probably was on a Tuesday night. And, uh, man, we had a service and a half there that night. I mean, boy, it was good. It was like Sunday night. People testifying. And a couple of folks got saved. And matter of fact, they, of course, the church there had a baptistry in the church. And a couple of those people wanted to just go ahead and follow the Lord and believers baptism. And Dad said, Steve, won't you get up there in the baptistry? And and uh, go ahead and get these people ready for baptism. So I remember baptizing a few of those people, and and uh, we just had a great service that night. And I came home that night about probably around 9.30 or so and walked in the door, tried to be as quiet as I could, and I uh, heard my wife over there in the bedroom there, and I, I didn't even turn the light on because I didn't want to wake her. She really wasn't feeling well. And so I walked in the room, and I remember taking my coat off and putting it on the hanger and laying it right there on the doorknob. And she turned around. She wasn't sleeping. She turned around. She said, how was service tonight? And I said, it was great. And I said, man, you, this is wonderful. I hated to elaborate because she missed it. And you, you hated to say, oh, honey, you missed it. She was sick. I just didn't even want to do that. And uh, she said, well, what happened? And I said, well, I said, uh, honey, you're not going to believe it, but so-and-so got saved. She said, really? I mean, it was one of the ladies in the church. I can't remember who exactly it was. And... And uh, she said, yeah, and, and, and it just surprised me, and it surprised her. And I said, yeah, she got saved tonight. And I baptized her, and she said, wow. And she just laid back down. So I went in there and did what most all men do at night. They watch a little sports center. And I, I sat on the couch. I was flipping, watching some sports center. And, uh, and, and, I, and I, you know, didn't have the, again, didn't have the TV loud because it would wake her up. And so I heard some sniffling heard uh, you know so, so, like somebody was crying so uh, I turned it kind of muted it down and I heard Rebecca in there and I thought maybe she was uh, blowing her nose or you know she'd been sick and so I said honey are you okay and she came around the side there the, in the doorway and she had boy she was just I mean tears just falling off her cheeks and I said honey what is wrong she said honey I'm not saved I'm not saved now hold on a second folks she was not even at church that night and I said, well, and so I said, honey, uh, have a seat here on the couch. And I said, what do you mean you're not saved? And I'm thinking in my mind, honey, I've been married to you at that time, probably a year and a half. And she went to Bible college and graduated from Bible college. And, and, and of course, she didn't really grow up in a church like this and under, uh, you know, uh, it didn't have really a youth group or anything like that. And had a great testimony of how God brought her to where she was at that point. And I said, honey, now let's, let's rewind a little bit. She said, I'm telling you, I have been rewinding all night. And I've never put my faith, my complete faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. She said, I've led people to Christ. I've done all the things that I think the Bible says. And I've tried to obey and you know, submit myself to you as, as a wife and be your helpmate. And I've tried to do things, but she said, I've always done it in the energy of my flesh and done it as a pleasing thing to the Lord for salvation, but I've never, I've never just gave it all to Him. And she said, I need to do that tonight. And we bowed right there at the couch, and she prayed out loud and asked Jesus Christ to save her. And listen, I got to baptize my own wife. 
She wasn't in church. I mean, we, we made it public the next Sunday, and, and we rejoiced, and, and it was a blessing. You say, preacher, were you embarrassed that a preacher's wife got saved? Absolutely not. I was rejoicing in the fact that she didn't live that life like many people and say, now I'm too old, and now I've got some influence, and now I'm a pastor's wife, and I, now I can't. I remember J. Harold Smith, a Woodruff native, amen, Woodruff, South Carolina. Harold Smith Boulevard Street. It's over there somewhere. J. Harold Smith preached God's three deadlines. I forget over a million souls have been saved by that one message, but the power of God, but one message preached over a million souls saved. Preachers, why? He preached it at Bobby Robertson's church. They were calling Brother Bobby at 2 o'clock in the morning. I need to be saved. I need to be saved. I need to be saved. Folks, listen, it wasn't scare tactics. It was the power of God. Something happens when the power of God starts convicting people. The Holy Spirit of God convicts. And let me just say this. If you've never been convicted by the Holy Ghost, then you've never been saved. Without any conviction, you cannot be converted. You don't just get saved because you, oh, now I'm going to get saved because it's convenient. No. You get saved because you're convicted of your sin and realize you're about to go to hell if you don't get saved. Amen? There's a conviction. They, these people knew not, uh, listen, they, they knew not God before they were saved. When the Galatians worshipped idols, according to verse 8, they knew not God. That word knew, it comes from the Greek word edo, which carries the idea of perceiving or being aware of. And Paul says by verse 9, now ye have known God. He uses the Greek word genisko, which means known. The word genisko speaks of a personal knowledge that comes from experience. John 17, 3 says, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. These Galatian believers knew God and knew them, and God knew them, and these were saved people. The only way that you can be saved tonight is if you've put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, you know God as a relationship, and He knows you tonight. Isn't that wonderful? He knows my name. Amen. I love that song. He knows my name. Every step that I take, every breath that I make, every, uh, uh, everything that I do, He knows everything about me and I know Him. Then there's a perilous place and I'm done. That perilous place. Look at verses 9 and 10. Notice what he says in the latter part of verse 9. How turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Paul asked that question. You're going back to that? Ye observe days, months, and times, and years. It is tragically possible that these believers were sidetracked by false doctrine. And by the way, that still happens today. Here it is. We win souls to Christ, and we don't really disciple like we should and we don't follow up like we should and somehow these people that we've won to Christ but they end up in a some kind of crazy something. Amen. That's exactly what these Galatians, they, they, they were going back to bondage. They had been sidetracked by false doctrine. Galatians chapter 3 verse 1, O foolish Galatians who have bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth crucified among you. He uses that word foolish twice in the book of Galatians and that word foolish comes from the word uh, which means to be ignorant or no understanding or unwise. It speaks of someone who is lacking discernment. There's folks out here that are lacking discernment. They get saved and guess what they do? They start reading books after people that they shouldn't. That's why it's important that you and I start teaching them right away. You understand? Not everybody on TBN is good. Matter of fact, hardly any. Or CBN, or well, I don't know what they are. CNN, I, they ain't either. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Right, Roy got it, and uh, he got it. You know them televangelists, ain't uh, them YouTube preachers? Ain't many of them worth any two cents. I mean, listen, they, they, you, you, you will get bewitched. He uses that word bewitched. That word bewitched comes from, uh, it means to charm or to fascinate by false 
precincts. He, he uses that. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's not good. Bewitched. It's to fool somebody and fake them out and, and to put something on. And then there's the perplexed. Look at verse 11. I'm done. I'm afraid of you. Look at verse 11. I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. So their foolishness struck fear in Paul's heart. That word labor, it's the means to work hard or to be weary, and it carries the idea of laboring to the point of exhaustion. You know what Paul was saying? I'm exhausted in dealing with this crowd. You have... He uses that word, look at it, uh, in verse 11, the last word, what is it? It's the word what? Vain. Let's say it together. Vain. He uses that word vain. It comes from the word to be idle or to, without effect. It carries the idea of failure. Paul, I believe, in, by verse 11, it felt like a failure that he had taught these Galatians the word of God. And he said, hey, you have turned from idolatry to Christ, but now you're wanting to go back to idolatry. What are you doing? You're wanting to go back and serve a legalistic God. And he said, I feel like my efforts with you have been in vain. Let me just say this. How many preachers across America today feel like they are failures? Behind the pulpit they have labored, but they feel like they've labored in vain. Because the people they've been preaching and teaching to... I'll tell you what's sad, and we'll end on... Brother Jacob, you come on up here. I'll tell you what's sad is you preach your guts out on Sunday and you hear of a family leave and go into one of these Chuck E. Cheese churches. Oh, we don't want that anymore. You don't want the truth? We want something for the kids. No, what you're going to do is send them kids to hell. We don't want it. See, they want all the things. They want to go into a room and play Xbox and watch movies and they want cool hangouts and there's nothing wrong with having good things for kids and we're on our way to, to seeing great things. But folks, we better give them Jesus. This, uh, that other stuff, that's a bonus. If we get all that stuff one day, I, I feel like we're going to have wonderful facilities to facilitate hundreds of children. I think it's going to be great. That's my vision. I, I believe it's going to be wonderful. But folks, can we not miss the message? Ch There's Baptist preachers all over this area preaching their guts out, and they feel like Paul did. They feel like their ministry is in vain without effect, only to see people walk out the doors. How sad is it? Let me just tell you right now, church, and I didn't get done, but we're, we're done. I believe you see the gist of it. How defeated it could be to see a group of people you've been working with and laboring and teaching and training and discipling only to go back to what they left. Brother Peter, it would be like you working with someone in the RU and, and boy, they've been clean for several years several months or several years and just growing in the Lord and all of a sudden they turn and go back to that and you're like Lord did I just waste we know it's not about you know we're pleasing him but folks we'd like to see some things happen while we're down here to see some folks let me just tell you right now friend uh, Paul felt that you say was Paul you know, sometimes we preach Paul almost supernatural, but Paul wasn't supernatural. He was a sinner just like you and I. He had feelings just like you and I. I feel like sometimes Paul felt like what he was doing wasn't worth it. You ever felt that way? Can I get a witness tonight? You ever felt that way? Brother Dirk, you can feel that way working with bus ministry. Boy, you can feel like, man, I've tried to help that family and look at what... You know, Brother Linwood, you'll get these new converts in there. Sometimes it's just... But can I just tell you, can I encourage you tonight? Just keep on going. Because there's going to be some that stick. I was watching Bill take up the offering Sunday night. Bill got saved and baptized. And Bill's growing. He said, Preacher, I want to do something in the church. We're still working, but it's good to see some. That makes it, every, that makes it worth every mile. We all owe somebody a debt in our life for going the extra mile, do we not? We all do. There's somebody tonight that, there's some weary preacher tonight that preached to five people. You know it.
There's some weary preacher tonight that felt like, man, my whole ministry is in vain. It ain't been. I don't have the big crowds. I don't have the big days. don't have the nice buildings. I've just been up here. and I've... But you know what? When he gets to heaven one day, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen? May be faithful. It pays to be faithful. It pays to be faithful. It pays to turn to Jesus.